Okay, your Los Angeles Dodgers are just relentless. They just re-signed Ryan Brazier. They traded Caleb Ferguson to the Yankees. We're breaking it all down next here on Dodgers Dugout. It's time for Dodger Baseball. That's right. I don't care how many times this team rips my heart out, I'll never stop loving the Los Angeles Dodgers. Think blue, bleed blue, and I'm out. Hey, what's going on, Dodgers Nation? Doug McCain here, credentialed member of Dodgers Media. Friends call me DMAC. You can follow me on X, Instagram, and TikTok at DMAC underscore LA. Now, if you haven't yet, do us a huge favor and subscribe to the number one Dodgers YouTube channel. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that notification bell. Hit that like button. And as always, I want your takes down below in the comments section. What is your reaction? to the Dodgers re-signing Ryan Brazier and trading Caleb Ferguson on a scale of 1 to 10. How much do you like the signing of Ryan Brazier? By the way, another reminder... For our giveaways, all you have to do is be subscribed and comment done down below in the comment section. We are announcing our next giveaway very, very soon. But I want all your reactions down below in the comment section. What are your takes on the Dodgers re-signing Ryan Brazier and trading Caleb Ferguson? And for our latest Dodgers news, head over to DodgersNation.com. So fire up that signing sign because the Dodgers have re-signed right-handed pitcher Ryan Brazier. It was first reported by John Heyman and then Ken Rosenthal tweeted out free agent reliever Ryan Brazier in agreement with Dodgers on two-year $9 million contract. Sources tell The Athletic chance to reach $13 million total through incentives first with agreement John Heyman. So the Dodgers bring back their best reliever from last season. A guy that was absolutely outstanding when he put on the blue and they also traded away Caleb Ferguson. Now we're going to talk about the Caleb Ferguson trade a little later but let's focus on this signing because I think it is a fantastic signing by the Dodgers on a very great contract. This is a contract where you're looking at $9 million, potentially $13 million for someone who established himself after the all-star break after the Dodgers acquired him as a top 10 reliever in the sport. It's also not a long-term contract. You're not having to shell out a five-year deal like the Astros did for Josh Hader. Now, of course, he's not a Josh Hader. He's not his absolute prime or anything like that, but this is someone for a two-year stretch that could be absolutely elite for this team if he picks up where he left off from last season. And I'm going to give you five reasons why I think this was a great signing by the Dodgers. One, he was elite for the Dodgers last season. And when you bring back someone who was elite last season and he's back in your bullpen this season, well, that's a good thing, right? And I hear everyone out there, oh, the volatility of relievers. Relievers are one-hit wonders. They're so different from year to year. Yes, we've seen that in the past. Yes, that is possible with Brazier. It's not something that's outside the realm of possibility. There's also plenty of examples of relievers that are good every single year. And you don't have to look far to find an example of a Dodgers trade where they went out there and traded for a reliever in Chris Martin. He was outstanding for the Dodgers. The Dodgers didn't re-sign him. And he goes to Boston where he's been outstanding. He's been one of the best relievers in the sport. He picked up where he left off and he carried that momentum that he found with the Dodgers to Boston and has continued to excel in Beantown. So that could still be the case with Ryan Brazier in LA. And I got the sense on Saturday at Dodger Fest that the Dodgers weren't done. I talked to Dodgers general manager Brandon Gomes. I asked him to assess the bullpen if they were going to consider going out there and maybe making some more trades to bolster this bullpen. And he said all the right things like he always does. He talked about the talent level within that bullpen. But from a vibes perspective, from a the eyes don't lie perspective, you definitely saw the gears turning. Like, okay, maybe we're in talks with a player about a contract and talks to the team about a trade. It was clear to me, it was evident to me that this team was not done this offseason. And this clearly is proof of that. Going out there and bringing back Ryan Brazier, your best reliever down the stretch from last season. And he was also asked about Ryan Brazier. And he had this to say, Brandon Gomes said on Saturday, We've talked with him. We feel good about, obviously, the person that he was and how he contributed. We've stayed in touch with him, 
and let's see how things play out. Well, we clearly see how things played out. It turned into a two-year deal for Ryan Brazier, who was DFA'd last season. This is a pitcher that anyone in Major League Baseball could have signed. But of course, he ends up with the Dodgers, and they turn him into one of the best relievers in the sport down the stretch. So top five reasons why I think this was a great signing for LA. One, he was a lead for the Dodgers last season. Like I just mentioned, a 729 ERA in 20 games, 21 innings with the Red Sox in 2023. He gets released. The Dodgers pick him up, and he was outstanding. In 39 games, 38 and two-thirds innings with the Dodgers, he had a .70 ERA, a 6.27 ERA plus. That was the second lowest ERA for a pitcher that had tossed a minimum of 30 innings pitched in Dodgers franchise history. The only pitcher to have a lower ERA with 30 innings of work was Hank Aguirre, who had a .69 ERA in 1960. And if you look at where he ranked, In Major League Baseball for qualified relievers, after he was acquired, his 0.70 ERA was third. His 2.48 FIP was 11th. His 1.1 F4 was eighth. So, you know, I bring my facts to the fight, and the facts say that Ryan Brazier with the Dodgers was a top 5 to 10 reliever in the sport. Now, the second reason why I love this signing is it gives this Dodgers bullpen some continuity. You're bringing back a lot of familiar faces. Yes, you're possibly going to get back Daniel Hudson, see how he works out, Blake Trinan. We'll see what JP Fire Rising has. You got Joe Kelly. We'll break down the bullpen in a little bit here. But there's some continuity. And every year with the Dodgers, it feels like when we start to get towards the deadline, we're looking for, okay, who's going to be the next Chris Martin, right? He's going to be that guy the Dodgers can bring in and sprinkle that Dodgers pixie dust on, put that secret sauce on, and see if he can be a dominant reliever down the stretch. Well, hopefully you won't have to do that this season. Yeah, it'd be great to go out there and trade for a Devin Williams and a Tanner Scott, but those are made men, right? You don't need to go out there and fix them, per se. With a Ryan Brazier, you've already gone through that process. You were already able to teach him that cutter and add that to his arsenal. You were already able to fix the mechanical issues that improved his command. You already know what the elite version of Ryan Brazier looks like, so you don't have to go through that process this season. You can get that from the jump, and you don't need to endure any of those growing pains this season. So I love that about this signing. And then three, you got someone who, yes, he's going to be 37, but he can beat you in a lot of different ways, right? He has an above-average strikeout rate with the Dodgers, but also he limits hard contact at an elite level. He did that even with the Red Sox last season. That's probably one of the reasons why the Dodgers Dodgers took a flyer on him. If you look at his percentile rankings last year when it comes to limiting hard contact, he was in the 62nd percentile in ground ball rate, had a 51.1% ground ball rate. So more than half of the balls that were hit off him ended up on the ground. Also, he was in the 95th percentile in barrel rate. So 95th percentile in barrel rate. So that means Limiting barrels, limiting hard contact, had an average exit velocity of just 87.4 miles per hour. So this is someone that, even though he is getting up there in age as far as it's relative to pitchers in Major League Baseball, he's someone that the velocity is still there. Right, He can still hit 97 on the gun, but also doesn't necessarily rely on missing bats to be effective. He can absolutely limit hard contact, and that's how he can be effective. So I like my relievers to have a couple more clubs in their bags, so to speak, as far as how they can get hitters out. Ryan Brazier is a dynamic reliever. He also has the ability to go multiple innings. We saw that there in the postseason when he was one of the Dodgers' bullpen pieces that was phenomenal there in Game 2. Yes, he did give up a home run, but still, this is someone that has postseason chops as well. He is dynamic. He can go multiple innings and get you out multiple different ways, and I love his versatility. And then three... He was the biggest reason why the Dodgers bullpen turned their season around. I mean, let's not sugarcoat it. The Dodgers bullpen last season to start the year, they were an absolute dumpster fire. They were one of the worst in the league. You get Ryan Brazier. He made his first appearance against the Angels on the road. The bullpen showed out that night, and they were outstanding until the end of the season. From July 14th until the end of the season, the Dodgers led all of Major League Baseball in ERA. They were first in FIP. They were first in F4. So it took a couple of weeks to kind of get Ryan Brazier and this bullpen absolutely flawless. 
But still, I mean, they were just absolutely a wagon. They were a fantastic group down the stretch of the season. So you have all the key ingredients that made up that elite bullpen down the stretch back. You have Evan Phillips. You have Bruce Dark Ratterall, who is the only person in Major League Baseball on this team that had a lower ERA down the stretch than Ryan Brazier. People forget how great Bruce Dar was in 2023. He's back. You have Joe Kelly, who is striking out hitters at a higher clip than he ever had. He's throwing harder than he ever has. So lots of firepower in this bullpen, and you get that continuity back, as well as some other high upside additions that we'll talk about in a little bit. And then another thing we get here, number four, fourth reason why I love this signing, is you get an extremely effective, versatile, high-leverage reliever that can close games if you want to go that route, or you can throw him in any spots. He can be a very effective setup man for for Evan Phillips. Now, he doesn't have a ton of experience as a closer. 10 saves in his career. He had one save last year with the Dodgers, but you have an effective, a dependable, a reliable setup man for Evan Phillips. So if you're not going to go out there and acquire a true closer and you're going to go by committee, which I always think is the number one priority, I think you play the matchups. I've always been in favor of that. But can you mix things up possibly with Brazier, maybe getting a save or two here or there? He definitely has shown that, look, he has the chops for that. He's mature. He's done it once in his career with the Dodgers, so he could do it again. I love that. And then also, this is someone that you found you unlocked, right? So you unlocked this guy as far as how effective he was with the Dodgers. So the fifth reason why I love this signing is, you found the secret with him last season, and a lot of it had to do with the cutter. I mean, when they first signed him, he was at the minor league level. One of the first few bullpen sessions, they taught him that cutter. He added to his arsenal, and it changed things immediately for him because for most of his career, he was a fastball slider pitcher, and though he had some moments where he was effective, he was never this dominant. He never reached these heights like he did with the Dodgers, and then on top of that, you fix some of the command issues. You were able to reduce that walk rate. With the Dodgers, his walk rate was 7%. With the Red Sox this year, it was at 9.5%. You increased the strikeout rate. With the Red Sox, it was 18.9%. That number jumped to above average with the Dodgers at 26.6%. So it wasn't just the cutter. The cutter was a big piece of it because he was throwing it over 20% of the time, and it kept hitters off balance. He was inducing soft contact, missing barrels. I'm not saying it was his bread and cutter like it was for Kenley Jansen, but just to have that third pitch and find that formula for him, that tells me that you can continue on this success for next season and beyond. And I remember when... He was asked about this during the year, how he was able to turn things around. It was the cutter. He told reporters, I mean, there's no way you could have said if he starts throwing a cutter, he's going to start pitching really good. You can look. I'm not walking as many guys as I was early on this season. I'm throwing my slider more for strikes. Now, obviously, having the cutter helps, having another pitch to get guys off certain other pitches, but while working on the cutter, some other stuff started to come back. So really, you can't just point to one thing, but if you had to point to the biggest thing, that is probably it. It's not saying it's the magic elixir because if he throws a cutter and the command is still off, he's probably going to struggle, but I think that just aligned and refined those mechanics in was allowing him to take off and pitch elite for this team down the stretch. And also, with some other things we want to factor in, too, is the ground ball rate. I mean, the ground ball rate went from 33.3% to 51.1% for the Dodgers. So these are things to look for early on this season. Look for the effectiveness of the cutter. Look for the soft contact. Are you seeing a high ground ball rate? As long as you're seeing a ground ball rate above 50%, you are going to feel good about that. So if you're looking for things early in the year with Ryan Brazier, those are some things to monitor. Now, another thing to factor in as well is how does this impact the bullpen as a whole? Well, if you look at the Dodgers bullpen right now, you got Evan Phillips, you got Bruce Dar, Gradrell, you have Ryan Brazier, you have Joe Kelly, Alex Vesia, Blake Trinan, JP Fireisen, Ryan Yarbrough. That is a stacked bullpen. There's a lot of talent and firepower within that bullpen. I was talking to players over the weekend, and one thing I asked Evan Phillips is, I said, hey, everyone talks about the lineup. Everyone talks about the starting pitchers. But why do you think this bullpen can be a strength for this team? And here's what Evan Phillips had to say. 
I think versatility across the board. I think we have a lot of talented pitchers. We are, uh, we're getting healthier with Blake Trinan and Joe Kelly coming back, and then having some mainstays like myself, Bruce Dar, Caleb Ferguson, Alex Vesia. Uh, I think having that core group of guys to, to rely on in a multitude of roles is going to be great for us this season. And now, look, I hear you out there. Hey, D-Mac, but we need a lefty. We need a high-leverage lefty. You trade away Caleb Ferguson. Well, first thing I want to say about that is go look at Alex Vesia. Alex Vesia, after the All-Star break last season, he was really good. He was really good. I asked Alex Vesia how he was able to turn things around after the All-Star break. Here's what Vesia told me. You're really, really strong after the All-Star break. What was the key adjustment for you to be able to have that success? Uh, it was pretty much like locking in like my routine, right? You know, there's been a lot of talks with like the pitch clock, right? And then like my mechanics and everything like that. You know, after the All-Star break, I felt like I was very confident with my routine and, and kind of being able to adjust to that tempo. Um, you know, off season rolls around and you know, I still am working on that. You know, going into spring training right now, it's a, it's a main focus, you know, making sure that when the season rolls around that that routine is, is you know, locked in and ready to go. And then also you have Ryan Yarbrough. Ryan Yarbrough is someone who, he's dynamic. He can be a swing man. He can give you multiple innings of relief. Not your traditional reliever, right? Velocity-wise, he's one of the lowest in the league, but he's able to miss barrels as well. His delivery throws hitters off. So I think Ryan Yarbrough is someone that can really help this team. Now, ideally, you go out there and trade for Tanner Scott. If you go out there and trade for Tanner Scott, there are no flaws in this bullpen. I mean, you look at lefties and righties and High velocity guys, guys that can induce soft contact. That would give you a bullpen that you could argue is as good as the starting rotation, really, top to bottom. So will that happen? That remains to be seen. There were some rumors out there that the Dodgers were interested in Luzardo and Shane Bieber. So if they contact the Marlins on Luzardo, you have to believe that they at least mentioned the idea of Tanner Scott considering their needs and what they would like to address. So, yeah, for sure, you would like to have another left-handed reliever, but you won't just want a left-handed reliever for the sake of him being a left-handed reliever, right? Most pitchers are right-handed pitchers, and for me, it's can you get quality? With Brazier, he's quality, right? With Brazier, he's someone that is elite if he's right, and I think that he's someone that was right last year at the Dodgers, and I fully expect him to pick up where he left off, and I think from start to finish, he's going to be one of the better relievers in Major League Baseball. So you also factor in, too, what does this mean for some of these guys coming back? Who will be the odd man out if Daniel Hudson returns, if Blake Trinan returns, if you get something from J.P. Fireisen, which they are very high on. Now, Fireisen does have options, so you could go that route with him, but it's going to be very interesting to see how the depth plays out because we know you can never have enough pitching. We also know that injuries are inevitable, so it's a good problem to have. These are champagne problems, mind you, so I'm not overly concerned, but still, I think when you look at this team as a whole, there's plenty of depth at the minor league level, too. I mean, Kyle Hurt. Michael Grove out of the bullpen. The velocity was up. The command was better. You got Gus Varlin, who had some moments. You're going to not have Frasso for a while. I mean, come this Thursday, you're probably going to see Frasso and May and Gonsolin. Some of these guys move to the 60-day IL if you go that route. So from a roster standpoint, they'll be able to work that angle, and you're not going to be too much of in a roster crunch. And, but this is a great signing by the Dodgers. And look, I also want to point this out, too, that think about this. Think about the value you're getting. Think about the Dodgers putting themselves in a great position to get a pitcher of value because, one, they brought him in originally when every team in baseball could have had him. Two, they helped turn his career around. And three, he knows that he has pitched his best baseball with the Dodgers. So all those signs point him back to L.A. and get him back in a Dodgers uniform. Whereas, hey, you didn't have to find a way to get Ryan Brazier if he had this success with another team, right? Let's say another team traded for Ryan Brazier and he was really good, had a .70 ERA. The Dodgers would have to pay more of a premium. So I'm sure that they were able to get him at a better price, a better contract because of what they did for him and because he knows that he can have his most success with this team. That's why you see those incentives in there. He knows that there's a pretty good chance he'll probably be able to hit those incentives because of the team he's pitching for 
because of the pitching and coaching and developing and everything around him. So kudos to the Dodgers. This is another way that they're able to get high-level talent because of how elite of an organization they are. And I see people out there, I see people even tweeting me today about the Dodgers are ruining baseball. The Dodgers are getting all the high-priced talent. They're ruining baseball. What does this person say to me? This Twitter counts as Dodgers by everyone and ruin baseball. He says, celebrating it like a big deal when in reality, as always, your team was just able to outspend everyone else for him. Congrats. By the way, I love the in reality. But look, what you are doing is you are doing a disservice to whatever team you root for and its fans. Because really, the Dodgers, just because they've had a master class of an offseason, they're not afraid to spend, they are an organization that's good for baseball. Your organization is terrible for baseball because they're not spending. They're not doing enough to get fans in the stands and market their club and sign the right deals. The Dodgers have been a well-oiled machine for a long time, and it's paying dividends this offseason. But hey, guess what? It's a good chance the owner of your team is a billionaire too. He's just cheap, does not want to invest in his team. The Dodgers, they do. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that you have a great TV deal, but you have a great fan base. Every time you tune into a Dodger game, you buy some Dodger merch, you watch videos, you're helping your team. Look, that's just sometimes it's as simple as that. The Dodgers have the most involved fan base. And it helps them get players. So guess what? Your team doesn't do enough job, doesn't do a good enough job of either winning and building a strong foundation in your community and trying to fill the stands. I mean, look, the Dodgers are the Dodgers for a reason. It was built over decades and decades and over a hundred years. So hey, you know what? Cry more. Is I guess what I have to say here. Okay, cry more because the Dodgers, they are relentless. Okay, they're putting so much into this team, and there's no guarantee they're going to win. How amazing is that? This is baseball. This ain't the NBA. This ain't Max Verstappen in F1, right? This isn't anything like that. This is a sport where the best team does not always win. The best team heading into the postseason has a 30% chance of winning the World Series, but still knowing that the Dodgers have been as aggressive as ever, pushed every chip into the middle of the table, but still have done it in a sensible way where they signing teams to contracts that make sense for the player and the team. So, hey, I think it's a beautiful thing, and I think that these fans out there, they should really have this energy and place this energy towards their own franchises, their owners, their GM, and say, hey, do something. Do the do something meme to them because you guys are just sitting on your you know what and not going out there and being aggressive enough. It reminds me of the Dave Chappelle skit where it's the hide the money, y'all, the broke people around, right? They're the broke people, but they're actually not broke. They have tons of money. They're just not spending it. So I don't want to hear it. I do not want to hear it. But as far as the Caleb Ferguson trade, we're going to break that down a little later in a separate video once we get more information about who is involved in the trade. But really, in short, Caleb Ferguson is someone who has high-level talent. He's flashed that talent for stretches. But anytime you say they flash that talent, it's another word for inconsistency. Right? He's been inconsistent at times. You see him missing arm side high. You see him unable to land that breaking stuff sometimes in the zone. So I think Caleb Ferguson is someone that under one more year of team control, you probably didn't see yourself with a future with him. You want to open some spots as far as roles go. And I think it wasn't a roster crunch thing as much as, okay, Gage, he's someone, a guy above 30. It's not like he's a prospect, but I think you really, you were just trying to put guys in the right spots and you know that he's not going to have a big role down the stretch for your team. And you're really trying to crystallize that bullpen as much as you can now gain that clarity, and then put yourself in a position where we could be around the trade deadline, and the only thing this Dodgers team, hopefully, keep those fingers crossed and those toes, knock on every piece of wood you can find, and the only thing they're looking for is a high leverage left to reliever, and hopefully by that point, the Miami Marlins are in last place, and you're able to get Tanner Scott, right? So that's definitely something that could happen, but also we all know this is baseball, and with the injuries and the way things play out, it's so unpredictable, and that's why I think it's the best sport, but that's going to do it for this episode of Dodgers Dugout. And we got Ryan Brazier back. You guys know I've been pushing for Brazier for months now. He's back in Dodger blue. They get him back on a two-year contract. He's going to be a great fit for this team. This bullpen, they just got back their best reliever from last year on a really, really decent contract. So that's a big win, another big win, and a series of offseason wins for Andrew Friedman and this Dodgers team. But that's going to do it for this episode of Dodgers Dugout. My name is Doug McCain. Friends call me DMAC. You can follow me on X and Instagram at DMAC. By the way, it was great meeting a ton of you over the weekend 
at Dodger Stadium. I know I signed one dude's autograph. I think his name was Blake, I want to say. I knew I did a terrible job signing it. So if you want to DM me, I'll give you a better version if you truly want that. And I think you had, uh, why not, for sure, right? So uh, you can send me one, too. So uh, definitely hit me up with the DMs. I'll hook you up with a better one. And yeah, like I said, those giveaways are coming. The hats, I know you want to see those. So lots of exciting stuff happening here at Dodgers Nation. But I just want to say thank you, guys. We're about to have another exciting season. We're going to give you behind-the-scenes looks at Dodger Stadium. We're going to give you vlogs and inside stuff, inside info, and that's going to be all season here. So be sure to subscribe and follow me on X and Instagram at DMAC underscore LA. But that's going to do it. Hope you guys have a great Monday. We might be going live later. I think I'm going to do a live later in the day to talk more about these trades. We're going to break down the Caleb Ferguson trade, some takeaways from Dodger Fest, but that is going to do it for this episode. Dodgers, re-sign Ryan Brazier. Great move for LA. And remember, nothing brings together quite like Dodger baseball. Until next time, think blue, bleed blue, and I'm out.